We are thrilled to welcome Jancy Dunn and Scott Nash. So I, I, I had a child, and her name is Sylvie, and she's my daughter, and she learned, she picked up quickly that I was a good source of original material. So every night at around nine, when it was bedtime, she would say, tell me a story, no, a fresh story. And I'd be like, oh, this is exactly what I want to be doing at this time of night, but okay. So she had, because as Nora Ephron said, everything is copy, right? And I remember thinking, this could be a kid's book. She would, she would say, tell me the Teddy story again and again and again. And when she left for, for school, when she left for preschool, she would say, mommy, when I left for school, my teddy bear was on the bed, but when I came home, the teddy bear was on the floor. I think he was doing something while I was away. And I can remember when I was a child, I absolutely thought that my stuffed animals were real and they had rich inner lives. And so I said, hmm, that's a good idea for a story. Why don't we do that? So I made up this story about how her teddy bear would kind of surreptitiously call all of her friend's stuffed animals and they had a big old party. And then they would quickly clean up before she came home. And every night, the antics got wilder and wilder, and she loved it because um, she's a very, she's a, very uh, a rule follower, kind of. And the idea of the stuffed animals going a little bit berserk was immensely appealing for her. And so, again, because everything's copy and I have an agent, I thought, well, maybe I'll write it up and send it off. What the hey, you know? And I, I wrote up about, it's about 500 words, and I sent it off thinking, oh, my kid likes it. And I read it to a couple of her friends, and they loved it. And to my astonishment, and this isn't false humility, like, it, Candlewick bought it. And again, it was that Bob Love feeling like, what, really, are you sure? You know, I didn't want to. And, and so it was, a, it was very interesting because it was a brand new world for me. I was very familiar with book publishing, with magazine publishing. I write for newspapers. I knew that world, but this was different, and it was, it was fascinating. First of all, they, they scrutinize every single word, and, uh, and they look at it from different angles. For instance, the original title they came up with was, I'm afraid your teddy has been naughty today, and it's because I love the word naughty. And I, even when my child was a kid, you know, when she was really little, I'd say, are you being naughty? And I just, it's just my favorite word. But someone in the marketing department um, Googled Naughty and Teddy. And who knew people even wore Teddies anymore? Is that like a thing, you know? But, but they said, no, can't go with this. So we changed it to, right? And I, we changed it to, I'm afraid your Teddy is in trouble today. And that came also from when I would be in the children's um, book section with my daughter, you know, when she was little and just starting to learn to read, I myself loved a good grabber of a title, and if I saw that title, I would have grabbed that book immediately because, ooh, what's he doing, you know? And, and uh, Corduroy was one of my favorite books when I was a kid, and I just loved that whole idea. So every single word scrutinized, and even now, um, you know, we're working on a second book, Scott and I, and I heard back from my editor, hi, one of your characters is, um, Miss Crimple, and another is Mr. Fankel, and that sounds too much alike. Can you come up with a different last name? And I thought, wow, they're, they're, they're granular like that, like down to that. And, and you have to be careful even with last names. You know, you, you don't want to offend anybody, and so I did a poll. I often poll kids. They're my best crowdsource. And we used real names, and I sent back a list of names that for make kids giggle for whatever reason. And I hope no one has the last name of Shufflebottom in here, which is a real name, but that's what we went with. They were pleased by that. And so we, the plot is that Teddy phones up a couple of his friends, or texts them, I think, and then all the, all the, ki all the stuffed animals come over and they have a wild party. And some authors will tell you, I don't take from my own life, it comes right out of my own head. Well, I take directly from my own life. And I remember one of, we have a very small Brooklyn apartment, and my child, when she has playdates over, um, one of the things that they love is they would make a cushion mountain of all the couch and chair cushions, and then they took, um, when they were really little, um, cookie sheets, and they would slide down cushion mountain in my house. I'm that mom, you know, like in the other room, like looking up shoe websites while they're destroying my house. But I was one of the most popular moms in town. So that went in there, and all the mayhem that the teddy would kind of wreak, that 
It often came from suggestions from kids. And because I'm a researcher, whenever I do any work, I plunge into research. I over-research. I can't help it. I don't want to be caught out. Um, and also, just because it's fun. And so I thought, OK, if, if Teddy wreaks havoc kind of you know, while, while the kid is away, is that going to you know, prompt children to misbehave and wreak havoc on their own? So I asked around, you know, I interview, because I write for Oprah a lot, I, I interview a lot of psychologists, social psychologists, child psychologists. So I asked a bunch of child psychologists, including the head of the Yale Parenting Center, is this okay? You know, will that, is this a bad lesson? Because in this world, you know, you want to be careful about the lessons you're imparting. And he said, are you kidding? It is a child's wish to defy their parents, but they don't, they want to please their parents. And so if the, if the, Teddy's misbehaving, it's a safe outlet for them. You know, they, they, and it's so true. And he said, and, and children love to be self-righteous. Oh, I would never do that. I mean, even now, when, when I, you know, I mean, even as adults, we like to be self-righteous too, right? And he was even saying, you as an adult, you know, if you gossip, that's like a social norm that you're enforcing. Oh, I'm not gonna cheat on my husband, you know? And, and it's, it's the same kind of thing. And so he said, no, 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 it's very safe. Go for it, you know. So I felt a little bit better about that. And so then I, another thing that I learned with Cindy Lauper is she has a musical ear. Um, she doesn't, you know, she doesn't write music. She just, she just does it in her brain. And in fact, when she had a 300-word manuscript, I mean, a 300-page manuscript, I had to read it to her aloud. She, she, she's like, I don't, I'm not really a reader. Just read it to me aloud, and I'll, I'll just raise my hand if something's wrong. And... So it took months. I lost my voice. But she, it kind of taught me in a weird way the, the musicality of speech when you're, when you're speaking, you know? And so I would read, it was 500 words, which isn't very much, but I would read it aloud and read it aloud and read it aloud until it all made sense to my ear somehow. Um, so that was another interesting thing. And then uh, afterwards, you know, it was funny when, when I read it aloud to kids, afterwards I say, because I like to, again, crowdsource, and I would say, like, well, what, what else should Teddy do? And every single time I make an appearance, one child will raise their hand and say, maybe Teddy could make good choices. So I think sometimes, <laughs> like, I don't know if that'll sell necessarily. It might not sell. Teddy makes good choices. I mean, it could, I guess. Well, you know, maybe parents would buy that for the kids, right? But um, so they, they loved the mayhem. And because I had, um, you know, Scott may talk about this, you know, also is sometimes when there's a different, when there's a separate um, writer and an illustrator, they don't necessarily like you to communicate. And I do see why. I have a lot of friends who are authors. My husband is an author. And, um, you know, we can be neurotic. And, and it, that might drive an illustrator crazy. And just because you have something in your brain and they don't, in, you know, envision it the same way. It just doesn't seem fair. But we, I had to, I wanted to talk to him so badly. So we did, we, we broke through the wall. And I think, did, so I think he, it was on Facebook. And he said, come on, let's talk, right? It was on Facebook. And then we talked on the phone. And we were so simpatico. And it was, it was great. So, um, so that was kind of my journey to writing a kid's book. And it's been so lovely to do kids' events because um, I've been used to the Q&As that I get at adult um, readings. I've done six books, five books. And, um, but kids, they'll ask you anything. I always get, how old are you? And then um, one time I got, um, and I said, oh, yeah, you in the Minecraft shirt. Have you ever been bitten by a shark? <laughs> and I said, not yet. And of course, that sent off a whole, you know, how about a lion? You know, and then there was a lot of other biting questions. And uh, another time when I did a reading in New Jersey, where I'm from, I went to my elementary school. It was the happiest moment of my life. And um, there was a child who kept his hand on my knee the whole time, which was very comforting. You know, he was like four, and it was like his little warm hand. And then I usually get nervous, you know, I'm babbling now. There's always a little bit of nerves. But it was so sweet. So his question was, um, you know, and I said, you know, you with, um, um, with the Minecraft t-shirt again, uh, have you ever been to the Chuck E. Cheese in East Stroudsburg, New, New uh, Pennsylvania? And I said, no, I, I haven't. I'm clearly not living my best life, right? <laughs> so he recommended the 
wings, and that also prompted discussion. And my favorite thing is when um, you know I go to when I go visit at schools, I'll say, "What's the signal that every principal or teacher has to quiet down the kids?" Because the kids get very excited. You know, the most common is probably. Yeah, so that's what we go with. But it, sometimes it's eating marshmallows. So it's just this really sweet world. And um, even when I've done, I can remember I did one event where um, only parents showed up with babies. And I thought, all right, you know, I'll, I'll go with it, I guess. I don't know. The, the babies were definitely pre-verbal. But, and then I realized, oh, the parents want to be entertained. You know, So they wanted story time. They were so fried. And they were so punchy and so sleep deprived that they were laughing at all the jokes in the book. It was great. Um, so anyway, I do, after I had talked to Scott, I was really um, mindful when I was writing to put in, I can remember when I was a kid, um, reading books, I loved ones that were really rich in their illustrations where you could look and each time you would see something different. And there would be little things that you missed each time and you would see them again. And so I was writing that with Scott in mind because I knew he would do a fabulous job of putting in a million things. And even now when I'm reading it, I find little bits that I haven't seen before. And I know that's what a child loves as well. Um, so it's been you know, if I could, I would just do children's books. But as, you know, we were just, Scott and Nancy and I were talking about that today. If you want to be in this job, I mean, I'm very frank about it, and I'll be frank with you. You know, I have a million different things that I'm doing at all times in order to, to pay my bills. I do, I, I, re, I review books. I write quietly for a hospital chain website. I do um, uh, health stories, you know. I, I write... Um, I write for ARP magazine. I write for anybody. You, cat fancy, bring it, bring it. You pay me a good word rate, I'm in. And sometimes my husband Tom and I, sometimes people don't call and you're thinking, oh God, you know, a couple months will pass. So we're, we're, we're making it work, but it definitely, you know, we pay our own health care, we pay our own health insurance. And, um, and my father worked at JCPenney. And so he still, he cannot fathom why we do what we do. He supports me. But he has a pension now. You know, he's retired, and he had a health care plan. He had, he had everything. And so, you know, the trade-off is that it's a really wonderful job. But it, I would say the one downside is that there can be months where we can't, we can't pay our bills. And, and then something comes in, and, and I'll do a story on gastrointestinal problems, and everything will be fine, you know. Um, but anything you want to ask me during the Q&A, I really will happily answer. I have no filter whatsoever. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Whenever people tell me that they have no filter in my interview subjects, I'm like, oh, giddy, you know? Um, all right, so did you want to come up here, Scott? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so for the next book, we had, again, it just came directly from the kids, and we just... I just saw how they got animated when it was at a school. And my, my sister is a teacher, and she helped me out a lot. She's a third grade teacher, and I love teachers. And I would say things like, Heather, can you go to your principal's office? I need a poster on the wall of the principal's office, preferably an inspirational poster. Come back and tell me what your principal's you know, poster said. And she, she would say, OK, hang on. And then she'd come back and she'd say, dream big. And I would say, yes, of course, of course, dream big. And, um, you know, and then I would say, okay, what about your gym coach? What would, what did he say? In my day, it was Coach Sherman. I can't remember, did we leave Coach Sherman? Was it Coach Sherman or someone else? I think it was Coach Sherman. Yeah, I think it was. Um, he would, I said, what does he yell to all the students to get them to behave? And she said, uh, hang on, I'll be right back. Uh, one, two, three, eyes on me. And so I think that made it in two. Uh, and, you know, again, we went with, I'm, af you know, again, using a template, I'm afraid your teddy is in the principal's office. And we didn't want children to get too upset thinking Teddy was really in trouble. Um, but, you know, I think they, they can, if there's a little bit of peril and it's very safe and soft, it's a, it's a good thing. And at the end, everything works out okay. At the end of the first book, you can see there's like a little visual pun because, oh, another thing that we did, 
that, um, I'm sorry, see, I see, this is the way my whole career went. I was like, rit, 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 rit. Um, it all adds up in kind of an, impre an impressionistic way, right, to what I'm, where was I? What was I, Tom, what was I saying? Visual pun. So at the end, thank you, um, Teddy is, what we wanted to do is to not have a child in the book that you could see. And that was, you know, I, I love the idea of a child being able to put themselves in a book. And so we had a policeman, two policemen, which was Scott's idea, and he'll tell you about it, kind of showing up at a house and saying, you know, oh, your Teddy got in trouble today. And that you never saw the child, you just saw the people addressing the child. Because I remember what it was like, like you want to be in the book, you want to be directly in there. So it was a way for a child to participate. And um, we wanted to make the policemen, you know, stern but friendly. And then to make them human, halfway through the book, the policeman says, oh, it, we ended up making it a policewoman, also Scott's idea. Um, and she said, oh, I remember when I was a kid. Oh, I had a teddy bear too. Teddy looks a lot like you. All right, you can go. But then at the end, just to keep the cheekiness, because we didn't want it too sweet, um, you can see that Teddy's clutching a phone. And the last line is, you know, all right, go in there and clean up. Now, you be good now. And Teddy's winking and he's got a phone. So you know he's up to, you know, a little more mayhem next time. But again, safe mayhem. Um, and so it's been, it's been the most satisfying thing I've ever done. Like the world of children's books, there's no um, cranky rock stars or, um, you know, it's just, you know, people really, um, their hearts are in the right place, and it's just, I remember when I first met Scott face to face, we went to a Candlewick party, and I remember saying to the publicist, did I even tell you this guy? I said to Phoebe, the publicist, all right, who do I have to get to know here? You know, who's, who's, who, just, just put, put, point me towards who I have to talk to, and I'll, I'll get, you know, is there like book sales? And she was like, okay, let's take it down a notch. This is the children's book world. We don't need to like be a shark and head over to, you know, a person. And, and so I just had to just relax and talk about, you know, children's books with other authors. And it was delightful. So um, I, I hope that I can continue. And um, again, I wish I could do it full time, but the other stuff is very fun too and very interesting. And, um, and, and, and so I think, I think that's all I have for now. But again, you store up those questions and at the end you ask me anything. We're all, it's very quiet here, we can do what we like, right? And, um, and I'll happily answer. Okay. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Wherever you like. You can be right back here if you want. Yeah. Like behind you? No, no. Hold on one second. Let me. You know, there is this convention of, you know, uh, publishers do try to keep a wall between the authors and the illustrators. But when you've got somebody like Jancy, why would you do that? You know, it's, a, it's been delightful working with her uh, right from the get go, and she's been a catalyst for a lot of new ideas. Um, I also just wanted to say um, that that I that a little bit more about that convention of not talking to the to the author. I've I've broken down that wall many times, and it's it's every time I found it to be hugely beneficial because I'm used to collaborating. I come from the world of animation, and you know where it's a very collaborative process, and it's just great to have a conversation back and forth. I mean, so much of what we do is electronic, and I think I drove you a little bit nuts. I would call you and say, you know, what do you think about this and that, and the ideas would just build. It was great to have collaborators. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, I'm going to talk about the new book mostly, and a little bit about the the the, the initial book that I did with Jancy. But I also want to sort of talk a little bit about my uh, my uh, approach to illustration and my influences in illustration. And uh, <laughs> I call this the nostalgia uh, part of the talk, which is uh, where I'm coming from. I'm going to show you some, some of the illustrators that I really admire from my past. Um, 
like Jancy, uh, both she and I have uh, a, a real love and interest in uh, using either uh, animals that are animate in some way, they become characters, they become surrogates for children, they become uh, uh, toys, I think, in many ways, are the basis for ideas and storytelling with kids. I can think of many hours maybe large, maybe in some ways inspired by Ernest Shepard and Winnie the Pooh, the idea that these toys are imbued with stories and they just need to come out. And you know, I think it's probably common in a number of us that we played for hours and hours with stuffed animals and action figures. And it wasn't, I grew up in a childhood where it wasn't you know, uh, sort of pre-created sets of things. We, we would mix and match you know, teddy bears with superheroes. And just sort of, that became part of the storytelling. And I, I, I think it's, it's part of the wonder, it's one of the, one of the reasons I'm so taken by the idea of either animating stuffed animals or creating anthropomorphic animals in stories. Uh, this is Ernest Shepard. Um, he's sort of the illustrator that I want to be someday. I love the spontaneity of his line. I love the pathos in these characters. You just, you know, in just a few simple lines sort of fall in love with these. And I also like the sort of incongruities in some of these drawings, you know, the dot eyes, which are so expressive and simple, uh, I think actually brings, with simple faces, I think we sort of bring more of ourselves into the character, uh, but then have Rabbit here with, with uh, eyes that are a little bit more cartoony. Um, uh, Edward Ardizion, uh, who's a, another favorite of mine in, the, in that he does sort of impressionistic drawings uh, that are not terribly specific, but they're beautifully rendered and give you sort of evoke a sense of the place. Um, Edward Gorey, uh, for a myriad of reasons, I absolutely love his work. I, and I, I actually, as, I, as I've, I've been following Edward Gorey's work for many years, I like the more unconventional stuff. I love discovering things like this. You know, Teddy, uh, we've got a Teddy theme going here. And then uh, Garth Williams. Um, I, I think this is masterful work. Uh, this is a picture from um, The Cricket in Times Square, which I think is one of the greatest uh, children's books ever written. I absolutely love this. And I, uh, this is an example of the sort of illustrator that, again, that I would like to be. Um, I think that this is a magnificent drawing in that he's done something kind of strange and awkward with this character, with, this, with Milo. My, instead of Milo looking adoringly at Chester, you know, like what you would see in sort of conventional illustrations with kids like holding his hands up against his face, he's got his face down on the newspaper with one arm stretched out this way so he can be as close as he can possibly be to Chester the Cricket. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful image. Um, my, when I'm sketching, that's how I work. I work in a very immediate sort of way. This is, these are just random ideas for various, uh, various narratives that I'm building. Um, and these, this is, this is how I sketch. This is a uh, Hob riding, uh, actually this is our dog Zephyr. Um, and it's a story that I'm developing called The Makers. But it, the, that these sort of direct line drawings are, are sort of where I am at my core. You know, very spontaneous, uh, not, not overly fussed over. Uh, as What I'm trying to be as I grow as an illustrator is get beyond trying to have any modicum of, of perfection and really go with the uh, spontaneous drawings. Um, and these are, these are the images that I use in my, um, my novels uh, because I think they, I love, I love the way that they complement, oh, that's a different sort of image. Um, I like the way they complement uh, the text and don't get in the way of the text. Um, that said, I also love to do picture books and this style isn't necessarily right for picture books. Um, it can be, it's a little, it's a little, it can be a little bit edgy, a little terrifying in this case. Uh, this is a poster for uh, a, an exhibition that we did a couple of years ago called Wake Up Alice. But I also have a love back into the nostalgia realm for, um, for um, any number of illustrators from the past um, that 
that, I mean, this stuff feels very, very fresh to me. This stuff feels, um, uh, it, it feels very fresh and it also feels like it's more appropriate in some ways for picture books. Uh, this is Johnny Gruel's work for Raggedy Ann and Andy, another uh, marvelous series of books that feature stuffed animals, um, really emoting and really working with one another and creating adventures together. And this sort of style became sort of the basis for the way I sort of approach picture books, because I wanted to introduce a simpler line, uh, not an overly fussed over line uh, with bright colors. Um, I find these completely captivating. This is another Johnny Gruel image of, of Raggedy Ann. And these things, uh, I have a visceral love for these, because I, partially because I did grow up with them, but also I just think they're, they're magnificently um, conceived. Uh, this is Harrison Cady, um, another illustrator that I adore. Um, and then this is me. <laughs> This was done in uh, years ago. It's the start of my uh, illustration career. And I did this for American Girl. I worked for, <laughs> we all have interesting jobs. You know, I did work for a period of time with MTV and Nickelodeon. I also was the regu a regular contributor to American Girl. I did a column, I illustrated a column called Health, which was essentially letters from girls that were inevitably upset about something in this case, this is a girl who's afraid of, uh, afraid of the dark. And, um, and I did this for many years. And it was, a great, it was great practice to take sort of simple ideas and illustrate them. Um, but this one sort of really resonated. Um, uh, I got a lot of sort of reaction to this. Um, I actually did, uh, I sort of used this as a promotion for my early illustration and was very successful with it. People really enjoyed this particular image. And you can see that there's references from the aforementioned Johnny Gruel and uh, Harrison Cady and such. You're seeing some of those characters. And again, what I love about these characters as opposed to stuffed animals that are sort of contemporary stuffed animals is that they're fairly simply stated. And again, my theory is that the more simply stated a face, the more you bring some of your character to these, to these individual animals. And so this becomes a basis for some of what, what I'm eventually turns into our, our, my work with Jancy. Um, I, I sort of, I have built sort of one portion of my career has been stories with animate stuffed animals. This one's called Tough Flight, Fluff, The Case of Ducky's Missing Brain. Um, once again, uh, I, I, I love the idea of bringing something that's slightly irreverent, not, tr not necessarily sort of your traditional uh, sort of uh, character. Um, this was actually a fairly popular book. It was uh, sort of noir uh, meets stuffed animals. Um, and uh, basically he's a he's sort of gumshoe detective that works in a place up in, up in the attic, up in a place called Lost Attic, uh, where um, stuffs and action figures sort of live together. And this is a mystery about uh, a character named uh, Ducky whose brain has gone missing. But these are the sort of, these are the sort of images that, again, resonate with me. And they would show you a little bit of the background of uh, some of some of my artwork that does connect with stuffed animals. So um, I'm afraid your teddy has been naughty today. I got that right, right? This is right? Pretty has been, yeah, but this is before we changed it. So this, this came over the transom uh, from Candlewick, and I, I had a Samuel L. Jackson moment on this. Um, uh, I don't know if you know this story, but uh, Samuel L. Jackson said that when he was, when he was uh, offered uh, to be the lead in Snakes on a Plane, he took, it, he took the job basic, based on the title alone. And um, I sort of had the same feeling about this. I was like, I want to work on this. This is my sort of thing um, for many reasons. And then I actually I, I read through the text and realized, yet yeah, this is something that I need to work on. Um, this was <laughs> the initial um, cover concept for I'm afraid your teddy has been naughty today. Uh, suffice to say, it was not accepted. <laughs> But I wanted to show it to you because I dearly love it. And I think Jancy loved this one as well, but it wasn't going to fly. Um, but I love him holding that teddy, 
Teddy uh, is signed for his mugshot. Um, and then what I, what I do when I get a project like this, I start, I start developing very loose drawings for the characters um, in my sketchbooks. As you know, I use sketchbooks uh, as a way of developing stories and sort of getting immersed in the storytelling. So this is, uh, the other thing that's great about working with Jancy, one of many things that's great about working with Jancy is that she was so damn specific in, in what needed to be in the, what needed to be included in this narrative. And I'll, I'll you know, like there was a giraffe mentioned, there's a, there's an elephant mentioned, and I just was eating this stuff up. And there was actually, what I didn't notice in the initial manuscript is that it said, there are some scenes where there, there needed to be 25 stuffed animals jumping on a bed. Uh, but, so I had to develop 25 characters, which actually was a joy for me. It's this stuffed elephant. Um, this is my sketching process. This is the, I, I don't think I have the actual finished illustration of this, but this is the, um, my sketch of the uh, sofa mount, mountain that Jesse, that uh, Jancy was referring to. I don't know if you can even see what's in this. I like these drawings though. Uh, there's the teddy up on top sitting on a tray. There's a penguin on a tray. These are what I use as the basis for my drawings, uh, for the final drawings, and I try to maintain as much of the energy of these sketches in the final drawings. Uh, this, is, this is the 25 animals jumping, this is a, a detail of 25 animals jumping on a bed. Um, oh, uh, this is in there because uh, 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 for some reason while I, while I was working on that, this particular um, book, I was watching, you know the movie Paprika? I don't know, the anime uh, movie Paprika. There are these scenes with um, just tons of this, this visually rich images of all different sorts of toys, uh, statues, bouncing around. And this became sort of, uh, sort, of, sort of set the tone for the energy of some of the illustrations throughout this book. And then these are just more energy drawings, you know, dancing stuffed animals, which are profoundly creepy, but I love them. <laughs> um, more of the same. This is the, this is the police officers entering into the party scene. Uh, and these are all, you know, there's the, there's the uh, giraffe and such. These may not, you may not be seeing much in these, but they mean everything to me. These are, I actually use these as the basis for all the drawings. And this is... Uh, this is the, the animals getting together and uh, making not, only, not just pancakes, but pancakes with blueberries, whipped cream, and sprinkles, which became the image. This is the image from the poster. This is the final art. I'm pretty proud of that uh, pancake, by the way. And I think Jancy liked it as well. And this is the 25 animals bouncing on a bed. Um, and it's, uh, it was an absolute joy uh, to work on these. And you can see. I hope I've maintained some of the energy and some of the collage sort of quality in the final art. I work very directly from those sketches. I'm afraid your Teddy is in the principal's office. Um, I gave me a whole new challenge because I love the idea of these animals uh, suddenly uh, wreaking havoc on a school setting. It seemed perfect to me. Um, I start out by developing characters, and um, this is the principal, and I thought, well, we, Jancy and I had a discussion about how the, how the, how the principal should be conveyed, uh, shouldn't be uh, too uh, sort of marmish, you know, uh, too, you know, too square, so we, I, I actually, uh, and we were determined that it was going to be uh, African American woman, and my model for this and I, is uh, Brittany, uh, Brittany Holmes from uh, the uh, Carolina, I mean, for the um, Alabama Shakes, rather. And she became the model for this. I think that she has just got the most beautiful open face. Um, I didn't really look at, at Brittany as I was drawing this character, but she was the basis for that character. And this is the aforementioned Coach Sherman. <laughs> Um, who's based on this guy. I mean, this, uh, <laughs> there, that, this Coach Sherman exists, as it turns out, and those shorts just killed me. <laughs> so there's Coach Sherman, and then Mr. What's his name now? Is it still Crimple? Still Crimple. Still Crimple. We still got Crimple here. 
um, which um, the, uh, the publisher thought this guy looked a little too young to be an assistant to the principal, but I pointed out that there are a lot of young faces uh, in schools as well. So I wanted to have somebody who was, I wanted to have a character that was sympathetic to the, to the kids as they're reading through this and, and, the, uh, and the, uh, the Teddy is getting reprimanded by the principal. And then, now this is, this, this name's changed, right? This is real time stuff. No, it's, it's still the same. Okay, it's the same. And I, I offered these two. <laughs> And there was no trouble making a decision <laughs> as to, they wouldn't even consider the bald guy. Uh, this guy is based on um, Bob Ross and my brother. <laughs> so so um, this is how I sketch. This is how the layouts are done. They, I, keep, I really do draw on these sort of rough, uh, these roughly conceived uh, drawings. Um, I'm currently working digitally, which is really interesting for me. Uh, the tools have gotten, so I, I sort of went into the digital realm kicking and screaming, kind of really kicking and screaming. I didn't want to be, uh, I, didn't want to, I, I didn't want to move away from paper. But this is really conducive to the way I work. I like drawing right on top of rough sketches and we're, being able to work in layers really does help me sort of conceive of the, of the, of the picture of the, of the scenes and, the, and, and, and I hope give the characters a little bit of life. Um, I also do crazy things like I will set up, you know, stuffed animals uh, as models. Um, this actually inspired, this is a little bit of a digression, this inspired a workshop that I love to do. I love, I love working with kids and doing sort of drawing programs. And I, I thought drawing from stuffed animals was, was great, especially in these sort of dramatic poses. And uh, actually put together a seminar calling, called uh, Life Drawing Stuffed, Animal, uh, stuffed Animals and Action Figures, uh, which was hugely satisfying. And it was actually, this sounds really silly to do something like this, but kids really were able to sort of think about um, it was a, it's a great way to sort of teach figure drawing because you're able to sort of figure out the general shapes of a stuffed animal, and they were doing a lot of keen observational drawing. I mean, look at that kid on the look at kid on the left there. They're just they're, they they did some spectacular sketches. Um, when I'm working on a project, I was trying to think about how I go about you know, working on illustrations. And a lot of times there's, doing, completing the illustrations for a book takes a few months, can take a couple of months for me. And I find myself, I have this, this uh, sort of uh, new quirk of mine, which is that I find myself listening to specific soundtracks for um, specific books. Like my book, Blue Jay the Pirate, The High Seas Adventures of Blue Jay the Pirate, I listened exclusively to Mendelssohn. And then for a book that I was doing that was called um, the, the Magic Mel Carton, it's all John Coltrane. Uh, the music for Jancy's book, our book together, is, is this, uh, Tune Yards. Uh, I'm just throwing this out there. I would listen to Tune Yards because it's upbeat. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Merle Garbus's music, but it's this crazy sort of upbeat stuff. Um, talking Heads nonstop. It's been, you know, uh, it's buoyant sort of music. Um, I, I love the, and I was like sort of digging into, um, you know, music I haven't listened to. I haven't listened to Talking Heads in years, but there's a, the one song where he's, I don't have to prove that I am creative. I'm painting. I don't know if you know that song, but that was, I'm painting. I'm painting again. Uh, John Hartford. Uh, and, and this band, Girl Talk, which um, was recommended to me by Mark Ulrichson. Um, we were talking about what sort of music drives us as we're playing, and he said, if you're on a deadline and you really need something to help you along that's legal, <laughs> he said, girl talk is what to listen to. And uh, it is the catchiest stuff. I feel a little guilty about the fact that I do love this because it's, it is, it's, it, it's sort of, it's just a stream of catchy riffs. And it does, I have to tell you, I will recommend this if you are on a deadline and you're feeling like you don't have the energy for, do it, for uh, getting it accomplished, just try it. Try Girl Talk, <laughs> try Girl Talk. Um, and then I'd like to end, I want to show you just a sneak peek of um, 
of the illustrations for I'm Afraid Your Teddy's in the Principal's Office. And I want to tell you, this is like a reality show in some ways, or no, this is real life. Uh, Jancy has not seen these. These are all, these are all the images that I've, uh, my deadline uh, for these illustrations is today. And so, <laughs> here we go. I hope you like them. Um, this is the cover, not quite, what's that? She's, she doesn't look, she's looking, she's smiling, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the proposal for the cover. Um, uh, I think it says everything. <laughs> this is the front and I do. I do. Thank you for asking. I love, I love rendering type badly. Um, this is the front and back cover. Uh, these are the flaps. This is the dust jacket. So we're going to have the, the principal on one side and the teddy all painted up. It's sort of, uh, you know, a little, little peek into what's going to happen. And I won't, I'm going to give you sort of the general narrative here. And I, don't, I love how this woman's mind works, by the way. The, the premise here is that the stuffed animals have decided that they would hitch a ride. They, 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 they organized and decided that they're going to hitch a ride in the backpacks of about 100 kids. <laughs> and, and they escape, and they run like crazy through the halls, which um, I just love to no end that I'm getting to draw stuff like this. And I was able to, though I generally don't, make references to, I try to keep the, the time period in this fairly sort of neutral, but I couldn't resist uh, actually using some uh, backpacks that um, I did some research on and sort of did modifications of these fantastic backpacks that are available for kids. This is a cow face, there's an owl there, there's a Godzilla. I mean, these, are, these, are, these have been uh, doctored a little bit, but they're sort of inspired by actual backpacks. And then, um, and again, this is what Jancy comes up with, okay? They, their, their first stop was to go into the uh, cafeteria, and uh, they raided the cafeteria and sort of demanded food, but they also, and I, I, we haven't talked about this, but this is one of, this is one of the specs, is that, that one of the bad things that the stuffed animals did is that they made a sculpture out of, um, um, Sloppy Joe mix. It's like, how do you make a sculpture out of Sloppy Joe? So this is my, that's my attempt of creating a sculpture of Sloppy Joe mix. Thank you, Jancy. And then, uh, and this is missing things. This is missing type, obviously. But then they uh, start using pizzas as frisbees and making mustaches out of pasta. I didn't make this stuff up. Jancy made it up. So, um, and then they wrote their names, uh, sort of tagged the walls using uh, ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise. And the monkey there is, um, yeah. And then uh, the, our principal is constantly giving Mr. Crimple trouble for um, chuckling about various things. Uh, then they headed to the, uh, to the gym and sort of took over the gym, and uh, I sort of tease out what is going to happen next. We have a jump rope and this, uh, this character hiding behind the, the, the bleachers, and then they tie up. I had a good time. I had a good time with uh, Coach Sherman. Thank you very much. And then they headed to the, the band room, and they put uh, bubble, uh, bubble stuff, bubble, uh, soap bubbles into all of the brass uh, instruments. And in this case, I just focused on the brass instruments themselves and the bubbles. And then, this is probably my favorite, um, they, uh, they broke into the teacher's room. <laughs> and, um, and we talked back and forth about this has got to be a special teacher's room with barricades and cameras and uh, they're all looking, they're all looking for, you know, these are lookouts and the, the monkeys uh, interrupting the camera. And then I decided, well, what am I going to do? What are we going to do with the teacher's room? Well, I didn't need to think about it because Jancy came up with the ideas, 
which was that there should be a climbing wall, a trampoline, uh, ice cream, um, and I just, I just, I just love this woman. <laughs> On the trampoline there. Uh, and then they went into the art room and they set a glue trap for the art teacher. And he walked in and he's got a very neat, he's very, he's very proud of the fact that he has a neat art room. Uh, and they're, of course, enjoying seeing him be, being caught in the trap. And I put up, you know, some Kandinsky uh, images, some you know, modern art images, which is as you would see in a uh, in a kid's art room. And then uh, all sorts of craziness happens. Uh, they roll, they they roll in paint. They throw themselves up against the wall. Um, this is what I love to do. <laughs> and then they escape out the window uh, using pipe cleaners as, as a rope. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope this is convincing. I, I actually love that little spot of her holding the pipe cleaner escape rope. And then they chase them down through the, uh, through the, through the, uh, the grounds. And then they're brought in <laughs> Augustus. This is all of them, looking dejected. And then, as Jancy said, as happened in the, in the first book, the, uh, the principal recognizes that this is a teddy that's very similar to one that she had as a kid. And this is my depiction of the principal as a child reading trickster tales and to a, what looks to be a very content uh, teddy bear. And that's a close-up of that one. And then in the end, uh, she gets a big hug uh, from, and the animals rejoice. And I'm hoping the editor will allow me to have the paint on, on the principal's face. I'm hoping so. Um, and that is, those are the images for um, Teddy. <laughs> As we call these the Candlewick Workshops because we'd like to, um, uh, we'd also like to take your questions and talk about process, um, uh, and talk about how we go about developing these stories. So if any of you have any questions, please ask. Yes, Sally. Um, I have a question. First, I want to say my mother um, was a children's librarian in elementary school, so I love children's books, so it's so fun to see this. Um, I was wondering how you were chosen as the illustrator the first time around. Oh. The first book. Like how does the Candlewick pick you versus other illustrators? The first book ever? No, no, for, for her first book. The first time you guys worked together. Um, how were you chosen? I think it was I think I think it was because I had done Tough Fluff, the case of Ducky's missing brain. <laughs> Um, once you once you do, um, I'm going to put this up just so it's not as distracting. Um, I think it was because I had done this. I had done a previous book that featured stuffed animals, but I think beyond that, uh, this was an interesting one because the publisher is our is our editor on this, right? I think <laughs> We run a tight machine here. <laughs> there we go. Well, let's just leave that. Yeah, there we go. Um, this was an interesting one for me because our editor on this is actually the publisher as well. And I think that she was um, she was hell bent on putting the two of us together, right? It seemed like there yes. that was, yeah. And they, they want, usually they want someone in house, right? Like you have a stable of, yeah. you have a stable of, Illustrators and they like to, you know, stay within that realm, right? Yeah. And when they said, "Oh, do you, you know, are you familiar with the work of Scott and I should have thought, because I've never done a book. How many, how many books have you illustrated? Over sixty, right? And and I was, you know, I know all about you and because of the Bible and everything. And I thought, please, Jesus, you know. So <laughs> when they sent him the manuscript, I was, I was just waiting for huge response. It was torture. And then, and we were, then I said, yes, 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 great, yes, please, please, please. And so then they said, you said yes also. I said yes right away. And then when the, when the illustrations came in, 
to me, you, you saw today, and that was the first time I saw them, but they were the, the perfect mix of completely contemporary and absolute classics. Like, it was as if it was in a book that I had read and loved as a child long ago, much like the Johnny Gruel books. Like, there was, it was, I still don't know how he did it. It was as if he had pulled something from my early childhood memories, and it was, so much the way that I envisioned it, that when I saw some of his, I think I, I don't know if I told you this, but I burst into tears. Tom can tell you, I was just Tom. sobbing. Because, <laughs> because it was so, it, it was just so beautifully done. And there was so many visual jokes in there. Even the way that you had done the second book, there was so many funny things. The duck to me is the most joyous. Like, it's hard, it's, I think it's hard to do. I'm not an illustrator, but to convey joy in a very alive way, the way that you do, and the way the animals, they all have distinct personalities, and they were all so joyful, and that's what I saw in the first one, so but, I was thrilled. But I was equally thrilled with the, with the text, <laughs> because I, I'm looking for, I specifically, and maybe it is dipping into the, the uh, children's book of our past, or my past, or I think ours together, um, where uh, the book, it wasn't preachy, it was not pedantic, it was, it was, it was basically, I mean, as, as you probably know, I enjoy nonsense. And uh, that's, what, that's what was conveyed in this. And the idea of being sort of bad in some ways was actually was what was compelling for me as well. I loved, I loved the language. It sort of, it was clear that you had read this through. Because the language actually, it, it's, it's a good read. It's good to read aloud. Um, I think that you actually dealt with a lot of those. You, you're very detail oriented, you know, and it was it was beautiful to see these sort of situations that felt like a book that I, I think should be in contemporary parlance, but it's also it also felt like something that had been around forever. I agree. But thank you. The, the writing was terrific on that. Any other? Yes, Arthur. Yeah. I want to applaud the rebellious creativity that you've introduced here. But I'm having a bit of a double take. Like that. When I grew up, yeah. the children's books I had were designed to foster my docility and my deep respect for authority. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I wonder how thoroughly we've escaped that. Yeah. And your comment about whether the editor would allow paint on the teacher's face led me to believe that that you had to fight for you, for your freedom a little bit. What is the situation? Well, you wouldn't believe the discussions that we had. I and mean, Kennewick is a very is a wonderful publisher. But and what I what I really adore about them is that one, they nurture sort of roguish ideas. You know, they'll take ideas that are not fully formed and sort of see the merit in it or see the they'll see the value in something. But we I also love them because we can have an open dialogue about what works for kids, and I will make, I mean, we'll get into discussions with my very first book, Dinosaur Stomp. I used a black background, and I had dinosaurs with sharp teeth. Um, these, th I mean, this, this seems appropriate, but we, we are at least having those discussions, and what I like about Candlewick in particular is that we can talk those things through. And when I talk about, you know, things like the paint on the, on the uh, principal's face, I think sometimes there's concerns about uh, an adult uh, Unfortunately, um, in you know, sort of contemporary times, forcing a hug that can be problematic. But we do we need to remind them, and I will make the case that these are stuffed animals, <laughs> <laughs> and they have behaved badly. They've rolled in paint, and it is likely that she will get some paint on her on her cheek. I'm I'm anticipating that there will be some discussion about that. But I, I have to tell you that I I truly value our relationship with this publisher because they, 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 we do have, we have deep discussions about these very things, you know, is, is, is this right? And, you know, when we, talk, we talked about, Jancy referred to the, uh, you know, say how we're casting the police officers. All of those things are, you know, they're, they're wrought with, you know, our contemporary conception of, you know, who, what a police officer is. So I think, I think uh, my tendency, and I think it's yours as well, is that we're sort of playful about those things, right? It's yeah, not a, most definitely. Yeah. And I, I had gotten, you know, other offers from a 
publishers and they, one of them wanted Teddy to learn a lesson at the end. And I thought, oh, it's going to be too, you know, yeah. so dreary. Must yeah. he? So they wanted me to rewrite it. Yeah. And so I said, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Martha? It starts a whole discussion. Yeah. <laughs> and the underlying question is, should education be teaching morality, or should it be encouraging creativity and, and individual initiative? And I think it should do both. I think both is the answer. Uh, we're going to be on the side of creativity. I think that's where that's where we're placed. I, right? I, think that's, I would say that's so. Where we are. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Mark. I just basically want to thank both of you. I read this book that had a square with kindergarten, the kindergarten classes, so I read it with 20 of the kindergarten classes the past couple of years. And I think you both, when I was last came to Portland about five or ten years ago, he said he always wanted to keep the smell of Rockford out of his radio. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
to spoon feed them with everything. I, you know, I don't. I I, may, I went over that manuscript a thousand times, and I, I polished it. I, you know, it was like a diamond when I was done, and and I sent it off. And then I even, but I just for fun, I put in direction the directions that Scott mentioned, like, oh, I envision this page looking like this, just so I can really spell it out for them. I found that the more detail you provide, while also not seeming like you're a pain, you know, personality-wise, where they're like, uh-oh, we got a live one, you know, um, <laughs> that, that really helps. So, um, as advice, I would be as absolutely thorough and detailed and, and polished as you can be, because you want them to envision the finished manuscript and the book, and as much as you can send that their way, the better. Yes, no, nothing big. So I'm sorry to say we, we have to we do have a hard stop here at set we have to the library closes at seven, but I wanted to thank you all for coming today for <laughs>